challenge is we need more workers. We have to make sure that it's easier to prepare for work and to get the right skills. And we have to make sure that it pays to work to have the right incentives. This is what our workforce development agenda is all about. Last year, the House passed a measure which improves career and technical education to help get more people on a steady career path. The new government funding bill that we passed recently prioritizes apprenticeship programs as well as child care and early Head Start programs so that it's easier for parents to look for work. Earlier this week, the President signed an executive order aimed at increasing opportunities for those in need. And today, the Agriculture Committee is releasing a new farm bill. It includes reforms to help people on the SNAP program who are able to work, find work, and start taking those steps towards making a good living. In states like Kansas and Maine, we've seen that an approach combining work requirements with work supports like apprenticeships and skills training has phenomenal success. This is going to help get more Americans out of poverty. And it's going to help more Americans get into the workforce while maintaining support for those in need. So I want to commend Chairman Connolly for his work. We look forward to making more progress on this agenda in the weeks ahead. And this was a critical component of our Better Way agenda that we are excited about executing. Lastly, not that anyone needs reminding, uh, we are just five days away from tax day. This year, when you submit your tax returns, you are saying goodbye to that old tax code for good. In its place, you will have a new tax code with lower rates, a nearly doubled standard deduction, and an expanded child tax credit. You're saying goodbye to an awful lot of hassle, too, as nearly 9 out of 10 Americans will be able to file their taxes in a simple and straightforward way. This, of course, is on top of all the benefits that Americans have already seen from tax reform through bonuses, raises, and higher 401k matches. As I said yesterday, this law is working. And it will make this country stronger and much more prosperous for years to come. Questions? Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the President seems to have gone back and forth a lot about what the objective and what uh, strategy might be deployed in Syria. We've asked you a number of times in the past couple of years about an AUMF. Wouldn't it be better to kind of codify what the objective is in an authorization, because that is up to the Congress, especially since the President now seems to be going back and forth so much? Well, he has the authority under the existing AUMF. Um, what I would hate to do in this time when we have asymmetric threats all across the globe, particularly with ISIS, uh, is to have an AUMF that short uh, that ties the hands of our military behind their backs. So the last thing I want to see is an AUMF that makes it much more difficult for our military uh, to respond to keep us safe, because they have the authority to do that right now. Um, as to Syria itself. Uh, Bashar Assad and his enablers in Tehran and Moscow um, have committed another mass atrocity on people in, in Syria. Uh, I think the U.S. has an obligation to lead an international response to hold people accountable for that. Uh, I won't get ahead of the President. Uh, he is taking a very deliberate and careful response and, and approach to this. Uh, we've discussed this, uh, and I don't want to get ahead of, of what, he, what, what he's going to plan on doing. Only to say that I think it's important for us uh, to help lead the international community to making sure that people are held accountable for these mass atrocities. But if I can follow up for a second here, you, said, you, you, you said you said he has he has the existing authority does, over AUMF. But I guess my question is is why not do new AUMF? Well, well my, no, 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 my question, no, my question is this: What is the authority there to do? Because that's the question. He seems to be dithering about what to do, and therefore under uh, the Constitution, think, I, shouldn't Congress? I think you're wrong to suggest that he's dithering. Uh, he is being deliberate, uh, and he is going through all of the options, and he's consulting our allies. That's what you want presidents to do in moments like this. So he's not differing. Um, with respect to the authorities, the existing AUMF gives him the authority he needs to do what he may or may not do. Rachel. Um, a small group of House Republicans are starting to suggest that it might be better for the majority if you step aside now and let a successor take over in terms of fundraising. Yeah. Um, if that does, are you prepared to do that if Look, they continue uh, to fall through? I've said all along, my plan is to stay here and run through the tape. Uh, you said a small group. Um, I've talked to a lot of members, a lot of members, who think it's in all of our best interest for this leadership team to stay in place and to run to the tape. Uh, I was encouraged that Steve Scalise this morning said that he thinks, you know, after the election, that Kevin, uh, that Kevin McCarthy ought to be uh, the person to replace me after the elections. I think mean, that's encouraging because what it shows you is that we have an intact leadership team 
um, that supports each other, that's all heading in the right direction. With respect to fundraising, uh, look, you all know that I came to this job um, as a policy guy, not a political guy, not a fundraiser. I have shattered every fundraising record any speaker has ever set. I came to this job with a speaker, um, with a goal of a speaker to raise $20 million. I doubled it to $40 million. Not only did I hit that goal, I hit it eight months early. So there is nobody who's come close to being able to raise the kind of funds I have and still can raise for this majority. So it's obviously in our interest to keeping our majority that every player is on the field fighting for this majority, raising for this majority, and it makes no sense to take the biggest fundraiser off the field. And I think almost all of our members see it that way as well. Yeah, who do you want? I'm with Univision. I'm glad you say that. I'm with Univision. Nice to meet you. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Mr. P uh, Speaker, do you plan to do something with DACA before you retire? And if so, what will that be? I certainly would like to. As you may or may not know, um, we offered uh, the Democrats a DACA solution. We offered them a solution for DACA uh, in addition to pairing it with a solution for the border. And the Democrat leadership chose not to take that offer. Um, that offer still stands. And I've spoken with the President many times about this. And so we would like to see a border security solution uh, along with a DACA solution. We made that offer, and, and I'm, I haven't rescinded that offer. So. Uh, when Speaker uh, Boehner left Congress in 2015, he talked about clearing the barn for a potential successor. Um, is that something that you're looking to do? It's and been what pretty clear already. <laughs> but you will have to do a spending bill at the end of the fiscal year that will likely require a bipartisan deal. Um, you've got the DACA solution yeah. still pending here. Is this something that you're looking to do? Yeah, when I say run through the tape, I mean get everything done that needs to get done. So absolutely. I want to get all the work that we need to get done. By the way, it's been incredibly productive what we've already been able to accomplish. Our military is now on path to being rebuilt. Our tax code is rewritten. The, the entire energy industry is back online, and it is going to put it is going to put OPEC in its shadow. Yeah. It, we have a regulatory relief system uh, and a regulatory relief agenda that is really turning business back on. We've got Dodd Frank repeal and replace coming through the system. We've got workforce development to continue. So we've got a lot that we've done. We still have a lot left to do. I'm excited about doing it. And uh, yeah, that's what I mean when I say run through the tape. When do you think you're going to take the farm bill up on the House floor? I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I would ask. I would, I would defer to the majority leader who schedules that. But um, soon is what I would say. We want to get this done this spring. But um, I don't off the top of my head know exactly when. Because he's introducing the bill right now. So right. he's going to have to do you know, hearings and markups and all that. Do you think you can pass it, though? You need mostly all Republicans. Yeah, I think we can like pass it because I think, what our, first of all, the commodity title is a fairly simple title because we've done, we did so many reforms in the last farm bill. We got rid of direct payments. We did lots of different reforms that were good pro-market reforms. And what most people don't know, and I know you do, but 80% of the farm bill is food stamps. And that is the area that has not gotten reformed. And when you have a fast-growing economy like we have right now, when you have wages rising, and you have new jobs and careers being offered, this is exactly the time when we need to pull people out of poverty, off of welfare, into the workforce, so they can get good careers, so they can get good livelihoods. That is exactly why we are confident that we can get this done, and why it's the, it's the precise thing we need to do to get people from welfare to work, and, and, the, and the food stamp reforms that, that Chairman Conway will be unveiling today, we do just that. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to follow up on Rachel's question. Can you just describe in more detail how you see this process of choosing your successor should play out? We're just hearing from all these members who don't find it tenable to think that this is just going to be a held in abeyance until after the election. I think it, it will play out like it always does, which is... Uh, um, you have a leadership election after the elections. And so um, I think our leadership team, the funny thing is, is when I came here, uh, into this job, I came into a vacuum. Into a vacuum. Um, I don't think we have that kind of a vacuum now. We have a very talented leadership team that is extremely experienced now. Uh, and that leadership team is in sync with one another and supportive of each other. And so I, I do not see that kind of a... Um, a, a of a disruptive process like we had. Like what do you say to these members who are afraid that seven months of sort of a shadow campaign is not good for the conference? I don't think you, I don't think we're going to have that. But to piggyback on their questions, if this becomes disruptive, 
Would oh, you reconsider your timeline, though? But would you reconsider your timeline? I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, All right. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, in the past 24 hours, as you've been talking about your, your years in leadership, there's been some criticism um, directed at you and some questions asked about how you um, dealt with the president's, let's say, aggressive rhetorical approach to politics versus your more civil, inclusive approach, as you'd like to talk about. That, that was euphemistically put. That was nice. I'm, I'm trying to get a question you're willing to answer, so you don't... <laughs> How do you how do you address though those critics that say that you basically deferred to the president and and did not I yeah, guess Gail stand up ask, for you? Gail asked me that question this morning. So here's what I think a lot of people would love to see me do: get in a food fight with the president of the United States and have Republicans tear each other up and not get anything done. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to actually get stuff done. I'm here to actually affect an agenda. The voters of this country elect Donald Trump president. The voters of this country gave us a House majority and a Senate majority. We have a duty and an obligation to take these majorities and get things done on behalf of the American people. So I'm not concerned about scoring points and ratings on TV. I'm concerned about getting things done to improve people's lives. And so to that end, I work on making sure that this unified government works in a unified way. You all know that, that no two people agree on everything. The President and I have had disagreements on plenty of things. What I find is constructive and helpful toward solving this country's problems, moving in the right direction, is to keep the kind of dialogue I have with the President, which is a private, personal dialogue, which is far better by talking to him instead of talking about him on TV. I can get more accomplished for what I think is the right thing to do by having a good relationship and a good dialogue than going out and just getting points, scoring points on TV, disrupting um, a unified government, and, and bringing government to a screeching halt. And does that's that, the way I see it. Okay, question. and does that mean, though, that, that there's a recognition that the voters, Republican voters at least, prefer his approach to um, your approach, think, which was the voters, traditional approach? I think voters were frustrated after eight years of malaise. Voters were frustrated after anemic economic growth. Voters were frustrated, and they wanted disruption, and they wanted stuff getting done. That's what we're doing. On immigration, there are some Republicans who are pushing for a queen of the hill type procedure. Do you see that as an as an avenue for voting on the budget? I don't. I don't think that that's. I don't think that's the, the right way to go. Um, Why not? Because I think we want to get legislation done in a way that we have a workable majority. We offered a good faith offer to the Democrats, um, and I don't want to bring legislation that won't get signed into law. Uh, I don't think it makes any sense to bring a bill through or a process through that will produce a bill that will get a presidential veto. I just don't think that that's in anyone's interest. So, Drucker, I think I answered your question. You did, and my follow-up. Yeah, yeah and so your follow-up. You. So, hey, there you have it. So, uh, Christina, I think um, it's just that simple. I don't want to spend our time bringing something through that I know is going to get vetoed. I would rather bring something through that's a solution that's going to actually make it into law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, are you endorsing Kevin McCarthy, too? After you retire, you're going to come out from marijuana like Boehner? <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? What did you say? You're going to come out from marijuana like Boehner after you retire. Hello, Chad. How are you? Thank you. 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 Thank you.